Hey guys, it's Malls. Thanks so much for listening to Please Advise. Just a quick message before the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. It's super helpful for us and super helpful for you. You can also call 323-450-7408 to get your calls on the show. Again, 323-450-7408. Or email askpleaseadvise at gmail.com with your voice notes or emails. Thanks so much. Oh, hey. How are you? Hey, Molly. How's it going? Good. It's episode what? Well, I guess this is a mini episode kind of, right? Yeah, we're doing a mini episode. So you guys saw we did the New York episodes. We're a little bit off, which I feel like is kind of cheating us because we're doing the episodes. We're just not yeah. counting them. Yeah. So like we probably have done 200 episodes already. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a couple mini episodes that have come out. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, legit please advise episodes, only 147 of them. I guess. I guess I guess what we count as legit. I mean, I don't know. That day that I podcasted for five days for five hours in New York felt pretty legit to me. I wasn't there. Yeah. So <laughs> fake news. <laughs> fake news. I will say this is that we it is November when you're hearing this, and it's November actually when we're recording this. Which means that we made it a year, and I mean, that was pretty bad, but it could have been worse, and I think that if we, you know, um, could do this, I mean, I, if, I, if, if I had to do this three more times, I think I could. Uh, I don't want to, um, but if, you know, I've been trying to think about, you know, at least one year is fully ticked off the, uh, ticked off here, so there's that. Um, there's also a lot going on in our political climate in Hollywood right now, our social climate as well. Um, do you want to get into that? Can you talk about that? Well, we were talking about like these allegations coming out and people talk about how they were an open secret. I mean, like I knew about Harvey Weinstein. I and, knew like, about I'm Harvey not Weinstein. super into the Hollywood community, but I like about- I definitely knew about how Harvey Weinstein, I knew about Kevin Spacey. Like there's no one that has been reported thus far that I am surprised or did not know about. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. if anything, I'm surprised that like there's more people out there that are haven't open been. secrets that yeah. haven't been called out yet. I mean, I can right off the top of my head, I can think of three. Um, that I'm just shocked that no one has spoken out about um, their – no, four, actually, that no one has spoken out about them yet. And I think it's a matter of time, and I think there's been whispers for a really long time. But, yeah, I mean, Andy well, Dick, not surprised by that. You know, I mean, yeah. and, and – you know, Andy Dick almost gets off on his bad behavior, which is yeah. And I don't, I don't mean to treat it so cavalierly. Like, no, it's oh, not cavalier. of course we knew. You know what I mean? Well, no, it's it's a statement on how you can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it goes back to we've talked a lot about sexual harassment on this show, and you've talked a lot about how it's a joke in the Hollywood community. Um, you and, don't go to HR. Well, no, you can't. Well, I would even extend that to even larger private corp. Just don't just go to a lawyer. Honestly, if you yeah. are being sexually harassed, go talk to a lawyer. Don't talk to your HR department. Well, the- they're ultimately there for the company, not you. Yeah, and the thing that really also has been like sticking with me about this is that you know this is Hollywood, so obviously it's getting a lot of attention. This is the, the most sensational place in the entire world, right? There's no more yeah. place that's more symbolic of the hub of culture than Hollywood. Um, So when all these like pretty white actresses start saying that, you know, this has been going on for years and this is the work environment I've lived in and this is the addition and, you know, whether or not I'm on a magazine cover all, all depends on whether or not I play along with this. You know, what do I have to say to the woman who works at Subway who gets harassed by her boss and has yeah. to put on a smile every day and go in because she needs to take care of her family? This is not just our industry. And, um, you know, anytime a woman is sexually assaulted or harassed, it's something that she has to carry with her every day for the rest of her life and she is she's affected by it. Um, and it doesn't just have to be like in the most, um, you know, my leg got dry humped by a famous Hollywood executive and I was traumatized by it. That is traumatizing. Um, it's not just that. It's all sorts of things that when you – these things pile up over time and they degrade a person's worth and they degrade a person's ability to speak up for themselves and um, ad- advocate for themselves in any place, whether it be – an office, at home, in a courtroom, um, when you've been taught by society over and over again that, like, it really doesn't matter what happens to you as long as, like, it really doesn't matter what happens to you. Just play along. Just show up and play along and be nice about it. And, um, 
you know, I've been thinking not just about everyone in Hollywood who's been affected by this and especially a lot of the kids who are dealing with Young men too, yeah. Yeah, and young women as well. And, you know, I do have to say I would like to like point out and I know we probably don't have any 10 millionaires listening to this podcast right now. Um, And I'm not sure that like Corey Feldman's fictional film is necessarily where I'd want to throw my money anyway. But I do feel that if there is a... If there's a Larry Flint out there who will give $10 million to lead to a Trump impeachment, if there's Peter Thiel who will sink hundreds of millions of dollars into taking down Gawker, um, there certainly should be someone who's willing to protect children. And, you know, I'm looking at people like Mark Zuckerberg. I'm looking at people like these liberal millionaires, multi-multi-millionaires, billionaires even, uh, that have not stepped up and said, yeah, I'll front the money for you to name names. Like, I will get you the legal protection you need. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. You're going to, like, I understand that that Trump's effect on America is crazy, but we're talking about, like, the safety of children and, you know, obviously the statute of limitations in California is 10 years, which is ridiculous. So, you know, let's say something happened to someone when they're 12, you're expecting them to have a fully formed, not only cognizant, memory of exactly what happened and realization of exactly what happened. Because I know that, you know, um, there's at least one sexual assault that I had in my life where I, it took me five years to figure out that that's what that was. And um, at that point I was, you know, maybe 28. So, you know, to ask a, a, you know, statute of limitations on that is up. But I just want to say that like, you know, that it can take a while for people to even realize what happened to them was sexual assault and then more than that feel like they can say something so um you know i really wish there was more people out there willing to throw some money at at the kids that are affected by all this in the business yeah yeah step up millionaires billionaires step up like it's just time like if you have money to take down a website because they outed you you have money to save children you know so I mean, what's more harmful, pedophiles or a fucking gossip website? I don't know. Um, but and I don't and I don't disagree with Peter Thiel's vendetta against Gawker, although I, you know, obviously worked for Gawker and love it and, and miss it a lot. Um, I don't I don't I don't I have no questions about why he had the vendetta against him. He did. But I do think that when something like this is going on and it really is as easy as throwing a shield of money at the at the victims um, you guys like step up, do it. I just, I just, I don't know why it's not happening. If we can raise all this money for hurricane relief and all this, you know, I mean, like, like, I, I just think we're creating, like, it's just creating another generation of pain and like, it's no one stepping up and doing the right thing about it. And like, I can give a hundred bucks to Corey Feldman's GoFundMe, but I don't even know if that will solve the answer. I don't know that just because he has a lot of the secrets, does it mean that that will be the the thing that you know solves it all and and I was able to basically figure out at least two of the people that have that have molested him uh through clues he's given he saw he revealed one of them he on, revealed on Dr. One. Oz, yeah and then there was another one that he said ran a teen nightclub in Los Angeles and that is uh there, it's well known who ra- ran that teen night club. It's called the Soda Pop Club. If you want to look that up, so um, yeah, it's anyway. been it's been a really dark time to like just see ac- accusation after accusation come up and reading these women and a lot of the men's um, accounts of how their sexual assault happened. It's it's been really really hard to read those things and hor- horrifying. And it's just it's so gross that like. The people who do that, but also people who perpetuate that system as well. Yeah. People who encourage people not to tell. People, those people are as filthy and as guilty as the people perpetuating the crimes in the first place. Completely agree with that. And yeah, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, I do want to say that, like, the ascension level of celebrity has been very disappointing to me because there are people like Rose McGowan and Patricia Arcad who I guess people could 
say are laughable or have been swept under the rug over the years as someone who's maybe crazy or different or has an unusual opinion. And then all of a sudden, you know, six days later when Gwyneth Paltrow finally says something, it's like, wow, we've really got something going on over yeah. here. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it, it's because that's, it's because the people that people are so quick to deem and label as crazy or as different or difficult, um, it makes me go back and reassess, like, why – what happened to those actresses who were labeled that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Sean Young or someone like that. Yeah. And you know that, like, the – um, so Rose McGowan's facing criminal charges now because uh, she left a bag on a plane um, and cocaine was found in it. And uh, I think I heard from someone pretty recently that that bag was actually found in 2011 mm-hmm. and that these charges are just now coming up. Yeah. So, in six years, that bag was never mentioned. It was never brought up. It's only now that she's speaking out that someone is saying, yo, she brought Coke on a plane. Well, and it's also, like, the NDA that she signed. Like, you have to have deal with the legal, legal ramifications of that, you know? Um, but, yeah. I mean, it's who's pulling those strings, you know, to yeah. make those things come through. I will say, like... You know, guys, like, right now, you know, it's as as important for guys to be as heavily involved in this. And this isn't something that women have to figure out together and that we're not playing the superheroes here right now. Like, we need our allies to stand forward with us. And, you know, guys need to be afraid for reasons other than they might lose their job. It's something that we have to... If you say you respect women and you do nothing to stop men from behaving like total, complete pigs... You're part of the problem. Absolutely. And like a lot of the thing I'm hearing from men, you know, and I kind of, you know, I kind of got into a little bit of an argument with this about someone the other day. And it wasn't really an argument. It was just kind of became a heated discussion. And I did say to them at one point, I just want you to realize they've been inside my house, like with like really bad depression for the last like five days. So I haven't really spoken to anyone out out loud about this, which is why I'm so angry, I think. But, um, you know, with guys, it's a lot of like, I'm not sorry that it happened. I'm sorry that we got caught. And that is not acceptable. Uh, And if your pure motivation and not sexually harassing women or being a shitty man in media or whatever it is, if your sole motivation is to not get caught, then you're a fucking asshole and you don't get it. And you honestly don't deserve to have women in your life. Uh, And you know, we are some of, I will say, I think we are the superior sex. I do think that that is a truth I have. I also love and respect men very much. I'm just not seeing a lot these days, especially now, uh, seeing the way that so many people I've, I've always grown to love. I've just loved and respect the way that they've handled it. Uh, the statements that have been coming out from people, the denials of, of knowledge, um, you know, if I, as a 22-year-old internet user slash intern, knew that stuff like this was going on with big, powerful executives that I still to this day have not met, if I had a working knowledge of that at that age, then you certainly, 40-year-old actor that's worked for the Weinstein Company, there's no fucking way you didn't know about this. Yeah. It was an open joke. Like, I mean, Seth MacFarlane made that joke a few years ago, and, like, there was a big laugh in the audience of him saying remember that like yeah. uh he's you, like you don't have to pretend pretend to <laughs> like congratu- harvey weinstein anymore yeah congratulations to all our nominees you no longer have to pretend to be attracted to harvey weinstein or something there was this big applause and like it's like yeah it's f- funny but it's also like you under like it's 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 funnier now that we understand what's going on but the fact that like that that it's an that it's not just an open secret it's an open open uh, now we're like, okay, I get why everyone there was laughing, but also laughter being the response to to the mass humiliation and sexual assault of women is, I mean, you're part of the problem, man, you know? I don't know. And it's tough, you know, because a lot of people are saying, why haven't these women stepped forward beforehand or whatever else? You know what? There's a reason why, like, the New York Times had to be the people to say it. And it's because the New York Times could take something like that on. Uh, your average citizen cannot take something like that on. 
And well, and there was also like the Ronan Farrow article yeah. that happened in the New Yorker, but it was originally supposed to run as part of an NBC report, and NBC killed it. Yeah, and why was that? Um, they said that they didn't have it wasn't on to, like so, it wasn't solid enough. The reporting wasn't solid enough. Yeah, it's yeah. not just like it's not women just- coming forward who don't. There's also like no, there wasn't a platform to be for them to be heard, even if they were coming to, towards people with these allegations. I'm not going to say anything just about NBC, but I will say that there are networks that I, there are many networks that I know of that have swept information such as, you know, everything from women beating to stuff like that, Access Hollywood tape under the rug because it's not a good look for them. And, um, you know, if that doesn't tell you that you can't trust HR, I don't know what is. It's like that people are NBC so worried about the way that it looks that it would literally like cover up for a woman beater or cover up for a sexual assault or cover up for, you know, say that, I'm sorry, this like isn't sturdy enough reporting. And, you know, look, like this is, uh, these are, you know, at this point, they're all allegations, but uh, this many like allegations can't be in stories that sound exactly the same told by different women who certainly all weren't in a room together repeating these stories. I mean, like, we saw this with the Cosby thing. Yeah. They were like all these women. Yeah. All the same story. Yep. Yep. It's just, it's, it's, um, it makes me really sad. <laughs> I mean, I was joking with you before we started recording. I was like, this month-long unveiling of sexual assault stories moved me a full number up on the Kinsey scale. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, I mean, I do wish – we really have to think about how we're raising men. And men need to think about how their colleagues, how their friends interact with women, Um, you know – if you say you love women, how how can you condone like certain behavior that men talk about? Like I don't if it, think about it as like if someone was talking shit about you, Molly, as a friend, yeah, I wouldn't stand for that. Yeah, same. You know, I would go off on them. Like men should be doing the same thing when other men are talking about women in a really derogatory way. I don't care if it kills the vibe of like your night out. I don't care if it like oh yeah no makes you like oh the guy who can't have fun and like who cares like it has to stop someone has to be the one to stop this kind of behavior perpetuating i don't know how we get there but christina like that said i mean like we can't just like yell i'm not going to be the person that just like yells at people do better do better um you know there had there's ways that you can do better like like as you said like be the guy that calls people out at you know a dinner table if someone's making inappropriate remarks or if you hear a story secondhand be like hey that's fucked up like you know what you did is fucked up and if i ever you know see or hear that again i'll you know report you or whatever like you a guy's instinct is always to say like i'll beat the shit out of him for you uh or like laughing about it you know what i mean oh yeah like well, yeah i mean well that said too like rape culture has changed a lot in that like I mean, I have dated guys in my life that have, like, not wanted me to be open about the fact that I've experienced sexual assaults because to them it's, like – You're tainted? Yeah. Like, they're embarrassed. Like, it's embarrassing to them that they could be with a girl who's been raped. And, like, that is – you know, even this year I've had guys – I remember saying to a guy friend of mine, like, God, I'm just so sick of being, like, fucking violated. And, like – I went, oh my God. And like, like as if like I like as if I grossed him out. And it's as opposed to like, well, what do you mean by that? Or, you know, not instead of asking a question, he was just like, oh God, I don't want to hear any more about that. You know? And it's like, why? Like, why, why? Because it's uncomfortable? Because do you think it's comfortable for me? They're not used to that level of discomfort where I think a lot of women we've gotten used to being just uncomfortable. Yeah. And trying to figure out how to cope with it. Yeah. Yeah. And which is also why, you know, I always say, too, is, like, why I want to protect my right as someone who's gone through something to talk about whatever I want, how I want to do it. And I understand that, like, you know, we've – this is almost a separate conversation, but, like, I am a proponent in letting victims process their shit however they need to. And, like, in the past for me, sometimes that has come forward in the form of jokes, and I feel that that's my right to do that because that's how I process information. Um, and it's never at the, to, to be at the expense of another victim, but also to say that like, I can't make what's a quote unquote rape joke because, um, you know, it's offensive to victims of rape. Well then don't, well, all you're doing is silencing my opportunity to express myself. And so 
um, I think that what we can do as women right now is also have a lot of compassion for each other and our understanding and to try and not come in on different levels where it's like, well, that was just a boob grab or that was just a, you know, inappropriate comment in the workplace. And you guys, it's not just men. Like I have been sexually harassed by women in the workplace. I've been sexually harassed by gay men in the workplace. I have been, it's not just like, you know, these like towering heterosexual men. It's like this, just this culture of just like picking on women. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful people picking on lesser people. This is a, this is a global issue. There's women everywhere. There's women of different colors. There's women of different socioeconomic status. There's women of different levels of power, education, And it's just, if this is the Hollywood elite, if this is how they're being treated um, and you're so appalled by that, I'm sure you can only imagine what it's like to be in a place where you have no voice at all, at all. No one's asking you, no one's standing up for you. But a lot of times when you see bad behavior from women, it's because they feel scared, abused, hurt, or have no other way out of it. And um, that's something to really like look at. And it's not just Hollywood or actresses who people have deemed crazy or, you know, uh, child stars who have been molested their entire lives and then have a a fucking mental breakdown in their 20s. Like, that's – that happens all over this country, you know, and all over the world. And so, yeah. Anyway, there's something that we have been wanting to talk about on this podcast. Christina, do you want to say anything else before we wrap up that segment? Because we're going to introduce someone that we've been dying to kind of talk to someone who works in this field for a long time. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit of like we have a kind of a lighthearted conversation, but we want to bring her back on to talk more with you guys about it. But before we move on to that segment, do you want to say anything else? Um, I, I do wonder how worthwhile it would be if we shared – you know, not at the expense of our own mental health, but if we shared our stories of sexual assault with people in our lives, you know? Yeah. If we were more open about those experiences instead of had carrying them with shame. um, You know, because you probably do, even if you don't think you know someone who hasn't been sexually assaulted, you probably do. Oh, no, you definitely do. You know? There's no way you don't. Like, what are the, the statistics are, like, crazy. Yeah. Uh, what, Do you have them? Do you know? Like, I don't have them. Yeah, it's just, like, I, I, you know, and, like, when you say that, I immediately take pause because that's a really fucking uncomfortable conversation to have. Right, this, which is why I say, like, don't have it at the expense of your own mental health. But if you're feeling in a place where you can share that with someone yeah. you care about and who, who you think maybe um treats these issues like so cavalierly because they have distance from them versus like if they knew someone who was like looking in their eyes and telling them this story yeah it might change the tenor of the conversations that we've been having or their approaches to like how they approach women i hope so i hope so and 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 I mean, I've had such backlash when I've had conversations like that with I remember a guy I dated said to me something like can you imagine being raped? Like, which, first of all, just don't ever ask anyone that question. And he's like, can you imagine? Like, can you imagine being raped? And, like, like two days later, I remember saying to him, like, when you said that, that really fucking struck a nerve with me because, like, I have been. And I remember his response was like, what? He's like, this is drama. I can't, I can't handle you bringing this up right now. This is drama. And it's like – Oh, I'm sorry that that's uncomfortable for you, you know? And it's like there's – unfortunately, people will never fail to surprise you with how fucking disappointing they are. I mean, I had an experience recently where I was talking to a male friend and he was like, can you believe these things were happening? And I was like, yes, I've been sexually assaulted. Here's one story. Um, And I was very honest about that story. Um, And he was just like – kind of blown away and i was like this happens to every and i was like that's not even the worst one yeah (laughs) and like he was just really hardened and really sad and like and it's just like it probably has happened to every single woman in your life yeah and i could just see it really taking hold in him i don't i don't know i think it's worthwhile you know again not at the expense of your mental health um you know and if you think the person's going to be receptive to that information i think being honest and having a conversation about your experiences could yield to some really, really helpful conversations. I don't, you know, I don't think it's 
fair to offer people like a full blown clean slate. But I do think that right now we're experiencing a sea change. It's incredibly important. And um, I think that a lot of people are afraid to. I mean, we we had a thing the other night where like I basically was saying to someone like, yeah, like you can't just act because you're woke now that like you're like you haven't done things in your life that are completely fucking unacceptable. But like also like I forgive you for that. But like let's not just like sit here and act like that's never happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think that that is a reason why guys get a little bit afraid to have this conversation is because they know that sooner rather than later they'll be implicated themselves. And, um, you know, because like it's normalized in our society, you know, it's normalized to, you know, grab a girl's ass or whatever when they're walking down the hallway. And I I don't think that we should like burn men at the stake for that because that was maybe something that happened when they were 14 years old and they were raised in a society that that encouraged them to do that um, or that like made you the man or that like, you know, that was a rite of passage of some sort. But, um, you know, it's a it's a mixture of knowing that like now is the time I think that you will receive the most um, open for the first time in a really long time an open response and an open acknowledgement from other women because first of all women are very quick to forgive we're very quick to when someone comes to us and says I made a mistake I think that women are are some of the best some of the best at forgiving out there and like I think that if, if we're also really quick to place the blame on ourselves. Like, yes. I did something wrong. I let him on. I did this wrong. Yeah. Um. So if a guy, I think, comes – if if you're, a guy, if you're a guy out there and you're afraid to stand up because you know you've done something wrong in your life, I mean, perhaps this is an opportunity to have an open conversation with a woman in your life about how maybe you made a mistake because you didn't know better um, and admit it and own up to it. And, you know, I mean, I've said and done things in my life that are not appropriate – um, and I own up to it and I, all I can do every day is try to be a slightly better person every day and try not to make the same mistakes I've made before. Um, but yeah, like I, I just think that like, if you're a guy out there who's afraid to say something because this could come back to you, why don't you think about owning unless, you know, unless you're a fucking serial rapist, why don't you think about maybe owning up to it and saying like, I would like to be a part of the change now. I've seen the mistakes I've made and I've made them subconsciously or unconsciously myself in the past. You know, if you're if you're willing to own up to your shit and then continue the dialogue from there, I think that that's incredibly important and that I personally am someone that you can come to and say that to. And no, I'm not saying flood our email with your confessions of date rape, but, um, you know, I can probably guarantee you that at least two of the guys who have assaulted me would say that they had no idea that they were doing it. That they didn't know that that was like inappropriate or that like there was bullying involved or like, like consent is an enthusiastic yes, you know, and not just a, all right, fine. You know, like just get it over with. Like that is something that, So anyway, Christina, do you have anything else you want to say? Mm -mm. So our guests came to us today through our emails because we've been asking for a long time to have on people that work in the field of sex work, um, which has also experienced a lot of uh, kind of new attitudes over the last, I would say, 10 years, really. Mm -hmm. More in the last five. Yeah. Um, You know, People are still, I mean, people are still learning to say sex worker over prostitute still to this day. Uh, I hear it like every single day on a podcast or something, every day. Um, and the word, I mean, I we had a guest here once who said the word horror like 19 times and I was mortified and I had no idea how to like stop it because I was so, I was so like, whoa, we kind of don't talk to our guests here like that. And also it's like not really like the message we put out there. But I was so horrified. I didn't know how to stop it dead in its tracks and say, like, okay, we, no, we don't do – that's not how we do things here. And, um, I, you know, I just – I wanted to get on someone who could be honest with us about their career as a sex worker, what they kind of have been up to for, the you know, the time that they've been doing it, how they got into it, what their experiences have been like. Um, 
I will say that I was pleasantly How they su- say safe? Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by a lot of her answers. I thought that she, there were certain things that we asked that were going to have a lot more tough answers. Um, but it does seem <laughs> like she runs a pretty clean and regulated business. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's, you know, uh, this is no encouragement to go be a sex worker, but I think that this is also just a conversation that this is a job that you can have in America. It's the oldest profession, and it is uh, something that is – it can not only be lucrative, but is safe and can be and can be safe and can be a conversation. It can also be very dangerous. Um, you know, there's it seems like this person that we talked to uses a lot of precautions, uh, which is incredibly important in a job like this. But um, this is uh, Jessa, you guys, and we had a conversation, and um, I met her in New York briefly, um, and I think we're gonna have her back again. And, you know, we didn't ask too many hard-hitting questions on this one. We wanted to kind of just figure out who she was, kind of get into a little bit of who she is. But um, I would love for her to be sort of a regular resource for us if you guys want to ask a sex sex worker something. If you want have a question about this, I would love for you guys to reach out 323-450-7408. Or email askpeasadvice at gmail.com with your voice notes or letters. So Jessa will be back as a resource anytime you want. So Jessa, thank you for agreeing to be on the show today. This is something that I've wanted to do for a long time and speak to a sex worker or someone who's been in the profession in the past or currently is or is aspiring to be. Um, and I'm sure that this is something that our audience is very curious about as well because I think that it's like a concept that eludes a lot of people. Um, so thanks for saying that you wanted to come on and talk to us. That'd be That's like really great. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we actually have a bunch of questions from one of your friends who emailed into us. But I want to start out by just asking you kind of like, how did you get into this? And uh, what was like your journey just in terms of like, you know, beginning, middle end, how you started and whether or not you're still doing it and stuff? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm still doing it. I kind of started, I actually started off stripping. Um, I was in college and I was going to do a study abroad program and had absolutely no money whatsoever. And I was like, hmm, what can I do to make money fast? And I was kind of really fascinated with the sort of sex industry. And there was a girl that I worked with. I was working at a restaurant and she was a dom. And so I would ask her a million questions because I was so fascinated. And she also stripped. And so she kind of, explained to me the whole situation of stripping and I was like screw it I'm gonna do it and so I went to a club and started there uh worked for probably like a year and then um kind of eventually ended up going to Australia long story short um moved to Australia randomly after some crazy shit happened in New York and moved down there tried to strip down there completely different world yeah, and one of my friends suggested working, like escorting, and I was kind of totally freaked out. But I was like, maybe I'll give it a shot. And I actually worked at a brothel there. Really? So, yeah. So, that's so what was myself, that was experience like? Um, very strange. <laughs> um, I worked at probably one of the best brothels in Sydney at the time. Um, there was, I think, 11 rooms, two floors. There was, I don't even know how many girls, 60, 70 girls that work there. Um, you'd, I mean, not that many at one time, but. Right. Yeah. So you'd. Yeah, so how many like guys would you see in one day? Well, you'd work 10 hour shifts. So, um, it could be anywhere from one person to 10 or more. So, wow. So yeah. obviously like that brings up a danger factor and that's like my number one thing. And I'm sure in the brothel, it's somewhat more regulated. Um, and maybe not. I don't know if there's ever been any experiences in which like you felt scared for your life. Is that, is that ever been the case? Uh, no. I mean, when I worked in Sydney, there was, there was uh, cameras everywhere. And um, they also had security, so it wasn't really ever a concern. As far as, like, working in New York City now, I screen everybody. There's, like, a whole process in screening. 
And I usually, I have a couple friends that I tell where I'm going, when I'm going to be there, if I'm okay, when I'm leaving, like I'm, and we have a, a friend that if we needed him, he would help us. So what kind of screening process does a guy in New York go through? I'm usually, uh, I generally ask for references of other girls that he's seen. And then I look into the girls that he's seen. If he's seen somebody, uh, ask them, contact them. And you like, there's kind of a network here in New York city. So you end up talking to a lot of the same people. So you kind of get comfortable with like accepting somebody's reference on, on a person. Yeah. And often girls will kind of, if a client asks, you know, is there anybody else I can see? We kind of recommend each other a lot of times as well. And then we have like all these different um, sites that you can do that are blacklist sites. So girls will go on if a client does something crazy or like he's creepy or whatever. Yeah. They can write in something about him and we can reference it. And then also I usually Google the hell out of somebody and I can pretty much find anything that you'd need to find on somebody. So obviously your customer base is probably like there is no average customer in this business, I'm sure. But like if you can give some like kind of character descriptions of the types of guys that you've met over the years, that'd be kind of cool. Okay. Um, Generally, I see a lot of middle aged men that are obviously more business oriented. Um. Usually they're on the heavier side. They're usually either balding or gray. Um, I see. I'm very tall, so I see a lot of short men. Yeah. Um, I see quite a few Indian men as well. Um, because I'm blonde. Indian men love tall blondes. Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so what? So are you listed on like sites or? Yeah. There's several different ad sites that you can be on. Um, they vary from state to state, but in New York city, the biggest one is called Eros. So oh, okay. Like the main one here. Yeah. So Christina has some questions for you. Hold on. Uh, Christi- Christina, Christina Lopez is going to chime in. Hey, Jessa, it's Christina. Okay. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> um, I had a question. So was there anyone that like, you've had a client that surprised you when you looked at him physically, you kind of just like, Oh, why do you, why would you come to me for services? Um, I mean, I guess there's been a few people that you're kind of, it's, it's, yeah, that are a little surprising. I had one guy that he's so beautiful and tall and just such a wonderful person, but he was married and wasn't, he was, he loved his wife and everything, but he just it wasn't getting the right things that he wanted from her. So I was like, oh, okay, that works. Mm-hmm. He just wanted to talk basically. So it was more talking than anything else. Does that is um, that uh, typical of a lot of a clients? Is it mostly talking? Yeah, it is actually a lot of talking. I like to call it naked therapy. There's a <laughs> lot of, yeah, there's a lot of back and forth, and people do just want to talk. It's kind of interesting. What seems to be like the universal issues like plaguing these men? Like, why would you, why would someone pay someone to talk? as opposed to an actual therapist, what it what seems to be like the most common through line for them? Well, I think it's just like touching and intimacy. It's mm-hmm. kind of people don't really get to have a lot of physical contact with one another. And somebody mm-hmm. just wants to be listened to and wants to be, you know, kind of just that soft touch. that's like, it's going to be okay. Everything's good. I'm listening to you. It's amazing how, that's a big deal, but people don't get that often. Even in marriages, you kind of, I think a lot of times people sort of, you know, you're, you're doing your job being married and you don't necessarily give each other that listening time all the Mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I've seen stuff pop up recently for like cuddling services where like adults just get cuddled because they want that kind of physical affection without like that, that penetration. That very intimate connection. Christina. Um, that's <laughs> just being an adult talking about it. Um, so are your customers only, do you only see cisgender men, heterosexual men? Um, that I'm aware of, yeah. I don't know if, I haven't had anybody. No women. Couples, no trans. I've seen okay. couples. Okay. 
but I've never seen a woman by herself. No. Um, does it make yeah, does the couple definitely. like do you experience something what kind of elements are at play when you're dealing with like a couple do you have to be a little bit more attentive to or about jealousy concerns and stuff like that i mean i'm always concerned about that because i've had you know had that issue in the past with kind of concern when i sh- actually when i stripped that was more of an issue women would get very protective and kind of strange but when they're looking for an escort they're not necessarily it's it's a different environment. Like they're usually involved as well. Mm-hmm. So it's not usually a jealousy role, but I'm always like kind of, I'm, I'm usually more attentive to the woman and generally it's like attentive to the woman, a little bit to the man and then kind of back and forth. And then eventually they sort of, you know, the three of us get involved and then eventually they usually go do their thing while I'm either watching or kind of playing from the side. So it's just like, you kind of just get their engines going essentially. Yeah, pretty much. So how has dating, like, in your real life been since start- starting this? Like, are you able to have a boyfriend? What's been the consensus? Are guys, like, are- I know some guys must be into it, but, like, what has been your experience? Uh, Okay, so for me, I've had an interesting journey. Um, I actually was dating a guy for five years, and he was a former client. And we just recently broke up in May. So, and now I'm not going to date for a very long time. So he, he had seen girls for years and I thought he was going to be very understanding. And we went back and forth for our entire relationship where one day he'd be okay with it. And the next day he wasn't. So that was kind of, it was, it was a lot to take with that. I know girls that are in relationships where the guys have no issues with it whatsoever. Um, I know girls that have worked and do not tell their partner at all. So it's I can't imagine pulling that off. I, I, I mean, me too. I don't understand how they can do that, but some girls just, I mean, we all, we've all had weird, like bad experiences where people just cannot handle it. And so I think there gets to be that protective where it's just like, I, I'm just going to figure out a way to make it, you not know, because it's worse if you know. So, Jesse, exactly. you you told us how you got started doing this, but what keeps you doing it specifically? I really enjoy meeting people. Yeah. Um, I find some of the most fascinating people through this work. I've met some of the like most amazing men and women. I have still am really close friends with a few people that I worked with in Australia, and that was like six years ago. So... I've just met great people and I've got some great stories from it. And I just really enjoy kind of having that interaction with people where they do feel comfortable with me and telling me things and being intimate with me in a like personal level, not necessarily sexual, but kind of in a yeah personal level. What you know, is, um, level. speaking of the stories you've gotten from this, what's like some, what's your favorite story? Well, I think my friend, she actually sent me what, uh, she wrote you guys so the, <laughs> the height. Oh yeah, I, I totally, I totally forgot about that until I saw that email. There was a guy there who was, was a- obsessed with measuring her height. Oh no way! Yeah. So like, would you just do it over and over again? So he actually, there was, I think there was, four, was there four of us? There was probably four of us. So he got four girls. We were with them for probably like five or six hours, and he measured. All of our, like, he measured our feet. He measured how tall we were. He would measure our, like, hands. He would, like, he would actually, he actually measured us along the wall. Like, he'd stand us all against the wall and, like, put little ticks above our heads and how tall we were. Well, that must be nice to have, like, accurate measurements, you know? (laughs) No, but, like, what was going through your head? Was it like, oh, this guy's weird? Or is like, oh, is he measuring me for, like, a, a skin suit? Or <laughs> I never thought about that. No, he <laughs> That's where of... my mind goes. <laughs> it's like he Silence just, of no, the Lambs all over again. Of... <laughs> right. Um, no, he was just kind of awkward and just goofy and nerdy. And you could tell that like he couldn't have interactions with people normally. So he just rented some girls. I don't know. And, it was kind of like the 
the four of us just kind of looked at each other. We're like, okay, this is what it is. Like, it's just nothing seems weird anymore, mm. which is so. I would think like the stereotypical kind of like dream scenario would be like you go to meet a guy and he opens the door and it's like, you know, uh, Bradley, uh, it probably is not Bradley Cooper, but Bradley Cooper, for example, like how, well, like what level, what's like, what's the high and the low of this job? Have you ever had a celebrity client? Like, I know obviously you can't give names, but like, have you ever had a celebrity client, an athlete, a politician? Um, and what's like on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of like, you know, maybe someone who hasn't left the house in 30 years? <laughs> Um, I have not had a celebrity, unfortunately, or at least not that I know of. If I have, I use some high big wig of something that I didn't know of, but I don't know, like celebrity wise, not that I know of. I have a friend that's seen a politician a few times and he's crazy. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I wish I could tell you more about that story. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, too. Um, but my mind will fill in the blanks. Um, and then on like the lower end of the spectrum, like what is, what's kind of like maybe one of the saddest stories you've ever had in terms of a client's background? Um, I mean, I've had clients that, um, when I was in Sydney, I had a client that was quadriplegic. I knew you were going to say that. Yes. Okay. I don't know why I knew it. I knew a quadriplegic was going to come up. Yeah. I mean, what else would you do? He, um, he had use of his two mouth. of his fingers. And no, he could move Chris- his arm. I oh, Christine, that's what you mean could, like other clients? <laughs> yeah, I just mean like where, like no, 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 no. I meant like what? Where else would if you're a quadriplegic, like you're not like at, they're not like having your friend roll you into oh. the bar and starting an organic <laughs> conversation, like. You know, like that's, I mean, in a certain, in a, many ways, an escort is a perfect solution to that. And like a lot of people, man, did I read an interesting Reddit thread re- recently that I'm not going to get into right now. But um, it's like, I think that there's a lot of people out there that like, you know, whether it be a physical ailment or, you know, like literally like some sort of inability to speak to women, like that would be yeah. very common. So the quadriplegic, tell me more. <laughs> More about him or more about other clients that are on the other spectrum? Give me a like a, a, a brief overview of him and then I want to hear about the other clients. He was actually probably one of my favorite clients. He was the sweetest guy in the world. He had the greatest personality. Um, he just was quadriplegic and had a colostomy bag and would spend i usually see him for six or seven hours Mm -hmm. it would be very long and um, we would talk and drink and play around and stuff but it was it was usually very draining emotionally and physically because we couldn't really do a lot but i still i had to do like everything yeah yeah um that's very interesting. I also, for some reason, assumed quadriplegic people don't really drink. For some reason, that that was an element of that that shocked me. Uh, tell me about oh, more of your. Drink, yeah. <laughs> tell me about more of your other <laughs> clients. Um, let's see. I've had. I have a client that he's probably in his late seventies, early eighties, and he's. Uh, I call him a squirmer. He squirms around a lot. So he like gets very excited and like forms like a worm. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. He's just he's he's very he's very sweet, but he's really old and I don't know how much detail to go into. <laughs> so with a lot of these guys, like, are they first timers or are they people that have seen escorts throughout the years? Um, I've seen some first timers and I've seen a lot of guys that I have I have regulars so there's guys that I see quite regularly once a month every other week once a week so it's it's either so what kind of cash are we talking here like what's if there's an arrangement I would imagine like it's kind of a better package deal than if you guys don't see each other regularly like what what can what can be lucrative about this for a person 
Um, well, usually girl, I mean, some people have arrangements. I haven't, I only did one arrangement. It didn't work out very well, but most of the time it's usually hourly. So uh. it'll, you know, one hour, two hours up to six overnight. You'll take trips with some guys. So, I mean, girls charge, some girls charge 200. I know there's girls that charge 15 to two grand for an hour. What do you charge? Do you mind if I ask? Uh, I charge 850 for an hour. That's great. Especially that quadriplegic. I mean, like, that's a great, (laughs) that's a, you know, my friend and I were talking about this recently and like, kind of like the arrangements thing. And she said that one girl for, $600 $600 a month, she had to go out on two dinner dates with a guy. And so, like, for me, I just said, like, I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I would, for $300, you could never get me to sit two nights of my month with someone and, and just talk to them and, like, go out with them and get dressed up. For 300 bucks, like, that wouldn't even, that would cover my phone bill. You know what I mean? Like, that's, like, yeah. it's crazy to me that someone would do that. It would be for me, it probably I probably would charge like see, my friend and I both said we'd charge like a thousand bucks for a dinner, you know, and yeah. then because some of these, I mean, so what's like the weirdest thing you ever had a guy say to you? Meaning like degrading, it's like accidentally like uh, offensive or. Um, I had this is when I first started working in New York. Um, probably one of the only really bad experiences. I had a guy that contacted me. He seemed kind of creepy. I didn't trust my gut instinct at the time. Um, Learned my lesson very quickly. Went to the hotel. He didn't answer the door. And so I left. And probably like an hour later, he started bombarding me with calls and emails and voicemails. Like kind of like deliberate style. Like squeal like a pal. I want to see you squeal like a pig. You're, you know, like it was just really vile. Oh my god! So what was yeah. did? What do you think his deal was? Why didn't he answer the door? There's some creepers out there. Yeah. So I I wasn't I was kind of just not really listening to myself, and I was I didn't do well enough screening. I was really new at the time, so I didn't really know what I was doing. Do you always meet at hotels, or what's like the deal with that? What what kind of level of hotel are we talking? Um, well, I don't, I, it's all nice hotels. I wouldn't go to a hotel like a Holiday Inn or anything like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody should really go to a Holiday like, Inn. Period, but, period. No <laughs> one should go to a Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> the dojo? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, usually the higher end hotels, but I actually see people at my apartment. Really? So, yeah. How do you work out the, payment, the payment situation? Uh, it's usually once they walk in the door, cash up front. Or if I'm meeting them out for dinner, they'll hand it to me in some sort of discreet manner, like in a newspaper, magazine, a gift bag, something like that. Do you ever worry about it being like a cop, like a sting? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Definitely worry about that. I do want to get um, to some of the question that your friend uh, told us to ask you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> she wrote She wrote in one part, please ask her to explain period stuff. She's got some g- great tips and tricks. <laughs> How I'm do like you- obsessed with that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I love you, dude. <laughs> do you get men that are obsessed with that? No, 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 no. I keep that on the low. Men don't, men get really freaky about it. Like Like, in a bad way? Yeah, like it really freaks. I mean, like when you're in a relationship, guys are much more like chill about it and they understand it. But when it's a client, like provider relationship, a lot of times it freaks them out. So do you, will you still see someone when you have your period? Yes. Um, How do you hide it from them? So, I, okay, I use makeup sponges. And I have to preface, I'm not a doctor, and I'm sure there's plenty of girls out there that are going to be like, are you kidding me? How dare she shove makeup sponges up her badge? But 
I usually do it right before the booking and like immediately afterwards. So it's only in there for like an hour, a couple hours. I never leave it in there very long, but I usually, I lube it up and I put a makeup sponge up there and like one of those little makeup uh, triangle square, like triangle. Like a beauty blender? Sponges. No, like, like a, a like a triangle blender. sponge. Yeah. I know. yeah. Like old ones from like the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those. The latex ones that you probably shouldn't be putting against your cervix. But yeah, I know other girls that don't see clients when they're on their period. I know some girls that use like soft cups. So there's a bunch of different options, but I use a makeup sponge. So if you don't mind me asking, I feel like we've talked about the most personal thing we can talk about here. Um, (laughs) What is like your monthly income? It varies. It's quite the ebb and flow of a business. I can make anywhere from $5,000 a month to $35,000 a month. Like Jesus. It, it can vary. And how does that show up on your taxes? I have, a, I have an accountant and I file taxes. I pay my taxes. We, she's, she knows how to deal with girls that are in my industry. Okay. I have like a, a business. So it goes through, I do everything that a normal freelancer does. Wow. Tax-wise. One of the other things that you, your friend said was uh, she wanted you, she asked to talk about um, why women with partners should feel empowered by sex escort, es- escorts and not threaten and angry towards them. Why? Well, do you have a really strong stance about that or... I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what, what she wanted me to say about that. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just because I think a lot of women just think that we're out to steal their partners, that we're trying to, that we're like the root of all evil. And it has, it's, I didn't seek their person out. They're, they're coming to me because they're missing something. And it doesn't necessarily mean that she, their, their partner can't provide it like, but there's something wrong that they can't provide it. It's like monogamy is really difficult. You have friends and family in your life for a reason. You can't rely on one person for everything. So I think when it comes to seeing an escort, they they give you something that your partner and your friends and family can't necessarily provide. Kind of like you go see a therapist or... Well, why would hope no one's mom somebody. is providing them with that? Uh, <laughs> girl, uh, Christina, do you have any other questions? Um, I actually am really curious about your like health insurance and like doctor yeah. regimen. Like, do you get checkups more often than the average person? Probably. Do you get tested more regularly? What's your health insurance situation? And also, what about the guys? Like, how do you know that they're clean? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I pay for insurance. I just have regular insurance. I do go more often. I'm quite neurotic. So I go probably once a month. It's kind of crazy. And I don't necessarily need to do that. But I do. Um, I I'm, use protection for everything. I'm very careful. I kind of do like my own personal little quick check before I do anything. So kind of make it look like I'm rubbing around and being all sexy and I'm looking at everything around their dick and balls to make sure that everything's fine. Uh huh. So you kind of incorporate that into foreplay is what you're saying. Sort of. Yeah. 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 Uh, or do you explicitly ask them as well? Like, is there something I should know about or worry about? Um, no, for the most part, guys generally that I see are quite, I mean, if they, if they see anybody, it's other providers. So, and I know we're all, I mean, for the most part, except for, for the most, well, as far as all the girls that I know are all safe. So we're probably safer. We're, we are safer than going to the bar and picking up some random chicks sometimes. So so you do I'm like do trying you, to be very diplomatic with all of my responses. No, you're doing great. You're doing a great job. Um so you do have <laughs> do you have unprotected sex? No, definitely never. Okay. Never. Not even in my private life. I'm like, nope. 
<laughs> How do blowjobs so, work in that world? Like, do you, I mean, like, do you use a condom for a blowjob? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. Now, like, what's if, like the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Go ahead. I was just going to say, what's the weirdest request you've ever received? Besides the measurement thing. <laughs> There's one guy that I've seen a few times with another uh, worker, another girl that I work with. Uh, she's a dom. And so we kind of double team him. He basically wants to hug me while she tortures him. That's probably the weirdest thing. Like wow. She's literally torturing him while he's hugging me. She okay. So that's really strange because normally I can see why like that might other. appeal to some people. Um, so we're gonna have to wrap it up, unfortunately. But I don't know if there's like a, a last like kind of statement you want to leave us with something that you want, please advise nation to know uh, about your industry and kind of your experience and everything else. Uh, um, I mean, we're human we're normal we're we're kind of like everyday people i know there's like a weird stigma that there's there's a weird weird stigma about us but we're kind of we're just like everybody else i don't know it's like being almost being like closeted sometimes where it's like i can't tell anybody about this life that i live and that's that's hard yeah yeah it must must make dating really hard too yeah yeah that I haven't, that's something now that I've broken up with my boyfriend, I'm not really sure dating. I, the thought of it kind of is frightening to me because I don't even know how to go about it now. Well, girl, so. you're safe with us. Thank you so much for calling in, like share, letting, letting us share uh, this today. And I would love to have you back. You guys, please advise nation. If you have any questions you want to ask Jessa, Jessa, would you be willing to come back? Oh yes, please. I'd love to. Awesome. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, so if you guys, 323-450-7408, if you have questions for Justin moving forward. Hey, thank you so much, and I hope you have a beautiful day. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Too, thank you. Stay safe. Have thank fun. Thank you. All right, bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, you guys, so this was kind of a heavy episode, but I think Justin was great. I think that was a nice way to kind of end that off. I, I think that if you guys have opinions or thoughts out there, if you take issue we're on bridge with anything that was said today. Definitely let us know on Twitter. Um, and please, PLZ underscore advise. We are also available on email at askpleaseadvise at gmail.com. You can also leave a voice note at 323-450-7408. And, you know, per usual, like, I'm going to cop to it. I am like you. This is not a show of experts. This is not a show of you guys hear my dog bites me. You know, you hear, you know, I... I have flubbed so many times over the years. I've said things that were completely off base and completely, you know, incorrect. And I've really responded to you guys um, and your notes and your critiques. And I know Christina has taken that on as well. Um, One thing I will ask is that you, if you do have something to say that you do it with kindness and compassion and the same kindness and compassion I think we try to treat you with. And, you know, there's definitely always opportunities to joke, but I don't think that, Either of us are going to learn a lot by getting yelled at. So I will tell you that. I don't think in general people learn a lot by being yelled at. Um, So if you, you know, want to bring a point to the table that we have maybe explored or that we said something today that, you know, you're bumping on it or you're uncomfortable with it, uh, reach out and let us know because we don't speak for everyone, but we speak for ourselves. We're two friends doing a podcast in my office in Glendale, California. Um, It couldn't be more... Uh, pedestrian in some ways. So just n- remember that we're just, you're talking to, t- you're listening to two people who are probably more like you than different. Um, and that's all we're trying to be. So um, thank you so much for listening. Christina, thanks for being my best friend and the best producer. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for being a good host. Okay. Thank you. Um, you guys, uh, thanks Bye. so much. And remember, if you leave, thank you, Wags. Attitude, thanks, Wags. Oh, he just perked up. Wags. <laughs> He's like, what? Have you assaulted mommy today? You know, you almost know that you're being asked about assault and now you're gaslighting me again. This is always right. I know he's acting real sweet. Like he wasn't barking at me all day today. Oh, Um, another man. 
another man treating you like you crazy in public. Um, but yeah, remember if we get to 500 iTunes reviews by the new year, we are, you know, somewhere in the 300s. We need some more action from you guys. So go to Apple Podcasts, look us up on the store, just search in PLZ Advise, and then go and leave a review and five stars. It's really, really easy to do. You can do it on your phone. It's a lot more simple than you might think. Um, so it really helps us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So go to iTunes and go to the Apple Podcast store within iTunes or do it on your phone, uh, in the Apple Podcast app. It really helps us. That's why we beg for this. We're not just like, please leave us reviews because it feels good. Um, it helps us climb in the charts. It helps more people find the show. Um, and with some of the stuff we talk about on the show, you know, I'm really proud and now looking back that we took those time, you know, I was proud at the time and I'm proud now that we took the time to do those women, Women's March episodes. Yeah. It made me really happy. So, um, you guys, we're here for you. Thank you for being here for us and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. 